Hi, everyone. This is your favorite friend, Jay, or Jailan Salah, as you formerly know her, fellow critic at Geek Vibes Nation and In Session Film. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Jeffrey Leiser, director of Prey This and Good Dredis, surrealistic, artistic, beautiful, operatic, black and white film that kind of takes us on an Icelandic saga, a beautiful moment in time where we go with these two beautiful women on a journey, on an epic of sorts. So, Jeffrey, first of all, thank you for talking to me. Thank you so much for having me here. So, what I want to ask you is, so you wrote and directed and produced a musical drama. Why? You know, I've been a composer for a long time, uh, and um, I actually did music for independent films. Uh, my brother's also a director. So um, my background is basically doing music, sound design, and I would write poetry and sort of, you know, screenplay ideas. And I think this this film and this project represented how I could coalesce all of my skills into one, you know, passion project. And another aspect of it was the fact that I always was really interested in Iceland. I visited with my brother when I was like 20. So it was really formative because I had never left the country before. So my first experience out of the country was a strange volcanic island uh, where people still believe in, you know, like like the supernatural, so hidden folk, the hulda folk, they say. And I was like, this is so fascinating. I need to read about these people, this history. Uh, and also, uh, especially my mom's side, uh, we have uh, Norwegian ancestors. So I, I, I was like, well, how, how did that play out as well? Uh, so it kind of was like the, the passion of the subject matter and wanting to, you know, see if I could pull this off. <laughs> wow. Okay, so this kind of tells me a little bit that when we are interested sometimes in our ancestors and in our heritage, sometimes we're inspired to dig deeper inside ourselves and to create. So what I loved is here, when you realize that your Norwegian ancestry, besides going to Iceland and just getting, absorbing the energy of the place, inspired you to create a tale that has elements from your personal stuff. And at the same time, it has elements of the myth itself, of the all the beauty of the myth. So I want to tell you and ask you, because I think about this a lot, how do you think looking and kind of like researching our ancestry helps us into looking in ourselves and finding inspiration and maybe creating something new that blends both? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think it's important to to look, if you have a record of that, uh, to kind of think about how did these people live? And maybe I think in this in this project, at least, I wanted to present something that felt uh, sort of modern, not in that I, you know, tried to enforce, you know, like current thinking or culture onto the story, but to help people remember that these people were just like us. They didn't have the technology we had, but I think about like uh, the Hanseatic League is a uh, a place in Bergen, Norway, where actually I got to visit, my family got to visit there uh, just like a year or two ago. And I was walking along the, the wharf and it was like from, you know, 13th century or even earlier. And I was thinking, okay, so, you know, these were people just like me, but they happened to, you know, be either working with the ships or trading or having, you know, maybe, a, you know, working at stores. Uh, and it kind of connects the dots for me. So I think it's important for everyone to, to see that, yeah, you're that it, it's important the, to all the people who worked so hard and went endured so much trials and hardship to to keep the human race going, and and that I can look back and say, wow, they worked really hard. They made a lot of sacrifices, and they dealt with a lot of, you know, uh, as far as like coming to North America, they had to go on these ships and get sick, and and women had to, you know, sometimes died in childbirth, and they were so just. I mean, courageous to even think that they could do that um, and, and leave their lands. And some people stayed, of course, but it's interesting to actually go there and think about that. Like, well, you know, some people stayed, some people went. And there's a few films about that. One's called The New Land. And they're just like, they're, so with cinema, I, 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 I like watching classic cinema and like world cinema. Uh, so I like to look at these things. And, and, and again, like with my project, I'm trying to have that sort of slice of life of like what represents you know, my journey and, and how I can use my gifts to, you know, to, to basically tell the story with the means that I have and try to be creative in that. Okay, so the color palette for the film is just brilliant. And I love the black and white. 
So I want to know your inspiration for it and why you felt that you needed to tell the story in that particular color palette. Yeah, that's a great question because I had an edit in both uh, color and black and white. Of course, we shot it in color. And uh, with the director of photography, Sam Kruger, we sat down and we're sort of like, well, this kind of feels like an old Hollywood type, you know, film. Uh, and of course, I, I mentioned I like these these old films, but I wasn't planning on doing that initially. But once we started working with the monochromatic palette, I actually thought that I that audiences like it's kind of counterintuitive. You think like, well, color they but I think with a monochromatic black and white, they could actually feel like they're there a little bit more and look through that glass of like, oh, wow, like the also the beauty of um, the contrast, I think, worked as well, because we shot all those backgrounds in Iceland on location. And of course, we shot uh, some as well with uh, Mikaela, who plays a uh, Gudrid. But um, we also did a lot of filming, most of it in a, on a soundstage. So I think to marry the foreground and background ended up working better on a technical level as well. But like, I, I love these old, these old black and white films, like they're on TCM. And like, I think with, with just like my experience on even theatrical movies, like there's old theatrical movies, movies like Laurence Olivier did with the Shakespeare and Orson Welles. And so I always remember those films. And even ones later, like there's a film of Johnny Depp called Dead Man. It's shot in black and white. Jim Jarmusch. Oh, yeah, Jim Jarmusch. And I can. It's I brilliant. know he's he's brilliant, and I I can't imagine that movie in color after no, you me know. Too. So so I think it's just beautiful. You know, I thought of doing maybe like muted or some color, and I the only color, of course, is the credits have paintings from my friend Heidi that I wanted to show the way she painted them because we hadn't quite made that decision at the time, and I commissioned her to paint uh, one painting per scene and. Um, I used it I, I, in the credits. I was going to maybe yeah. think of it as chapter markers, but I, it was disrupting the flow of the narrative to to have the paintings uh, throughout the film. So uh, I included them at the end. So that's that's how that happened. The paintings were beautiful too. I was just going to tell you thank about you. Okay. Oh, thank you. So I don't know, when you're, you have a background in music and like real experience, but how difficult or easy for you it was to direct you know, like this operatic saga, this epic with people singing and you have to be organizing everything as if you're the maestro of the whole thing. Like how hard was it? Because, and also is it different to direct like a regular feature whereas it's a musical and people are singing and it's all expressed in songs? Yeah, I think I think there's a few things I could say about that. Uh, the first is that I had worked with these, uh, most of the casts prior to this, because I did think of it also as a staged, you know, musical op opera. Um, in 2018, I did an hour long concert with a lot of the people, um, uh, not Mikaela, but um, uh, Freydis, who's, who's Kirsten Chambers. Uh, I'd worked with her and, and yeah, a lot of the other casts. So when it came time to filming, I felt very comfortable with them. And I'd also been friends with them. I mean, we had friends from all over, like friends from church or friends from just like our network in New York, uh, New York City, where uh, I lived for a long time until recently. So uh, kind of, it was kind of like a homecoming, like a, it, when we all got together and started rehearsals, it was like friends, you know? And I think that you get the best performances when you have that kinship together. Um, and also I think, um, I think there's a sort of hack with uh, musicals where uh, I know that the performers are also like good actors, but I think when you're doing a musical, because they're so talented at singing and selling a performance as, you know, staged people, I think in the, even with film, some of the best actors come from the stage because they're used to doing one take, you know, like they're on. And so we didn't have a lot of time to film. So when we did roll camera, it wasn't like we had to do a bunch of takes, but also it's hard because they're doing a song. Like, how are you going to stop a song a million times? Like, it, so we basically wanted to have three good takes We with each um, three cameras doing like three camera angles. So we ended up having like nine angles per, you know, scene. Uh, and there's a lot of continuity there. It has to be perfect. But they're again, like, because they're theater people, uh, opera sort of people, they like, they get it like scene blocking they're They're on it. So I felt like, uh, as far as the dra dramatic performances, if you're going to have a lower budget film like this, you better have really good performances. And I was really pleased with, you know, how, how they delivered. I was just going to ask you about Michaela and Kristen, because mm. they're amazing. And when I read the resumes, I was like surprised all this mm -hmm. 
like previous roles, like playing lead in Tristan and Isolde or Salome or just being in Andrea Rieu, like symphony. What is this? Oh, yeah. I want to know, <laughs> they're your friends, but how was the casting and how did you bring them together to create, you know, like Travis and Goodreads? Well, I have a really good story about Micaela because I didn't know her, but I had an aria from from this opera performed at, 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 at a Carnegie Hall program. The, oh. the uh, man who put on the program had also written uh, something for Freitas, but just one song. And he, f he through Kirsten, he found out about my film. And he was like, I want to have like another Freitas song on for this concert program. So his name's William, William Maselli. Uh, and he's a wonderful man. He's so generous. And I even like kind of asked permission later, like, Hey, can I, can I contact Michaela for, for, for doing this movie? And he's like, Oh, my, my blessing. I want to do a, a film about the sagas as well, but I just, I think you should you know, take the torch because it's so it's such an interesting story. So what happened was I didn't even meet her that night. Uh, she was on I was on stage with her, but I didn't get a chance to say hi. And then later, uh, the the Joni who played uh, her role for my uh, lab concert, she said, "Oh, I'm I have a conflict. I'm not able to play the role." So I thought, "Wow, Michaela, she was perfect. Like I got to see her sing on stage, but she lived in Germany, and then COVID happened." And I, I sent her an email. This is a crazy idea. COVID's happening. You're in Germany. If you can get out of the country, could you come to New York and record the music and then record the film? And she actually did it, which wow. is unreal. And I think also because she's so busy during COVID, she had the time to to take on a role like this. And this was before the big uh, Andre Rio tour, which she's blowing up now. Like she she's I mean, her her videos of the concerts are getting so many views and I'm so happy she's like doing these world tours in these huge arenas and yet she did a, a little project with me uh and so that that was my favorite thing about that okay so what I want to ask you because when you're talking now it feels so lovely the idea of indie filmmaking and grouping Lito together to just make this artistic project like do you have an eye for bigger budget projects or do you like the intimacy of, you know, like the small budgeting, the indie, the getting, you know, like word of mouth, friends of friends and stuff like that. And people I know, which one do you feel yourself drawn to? Because I think each has their perks and their pros and cons, but there is something in everyone's heart that, you know, like attracts them to something. Like, do you see yourself doing something bigger budget, bigger studios, stuff like that? Yeah, you know, uh, to be honest, I I have always dreamed really big. And I think that's why I did this project. And I did a symphony before this. And granted, it's classical, it's very niche. Uh, but I've always been a person who's been seeing myself as a film composer and a filmmaker. And even though I did like sort of this classical foray, I a lot of my projects or a lot of my screenplays are for large budget projects, whether that's like a TV series based on this or even directing or being part of a very large project. Like, so like Wagner did the the ring cycle, which is still performed on like opera stages all over the world. And I think they're like, for instance, that'd be a way you probably have to do a hybrid with dialogue because I don't think like opera is a hard sell, I, I think still. And even with this project, even though it is that, like I tried to make it more narrative and um, character driven right. for people who are sort of on the fence. But I, I, I do like dream of, things that would take way too many millions of dollars for me to pull off. But the good thing nowadays is that with the right concept, you you know, there's a lot of streaming services that are looking for content. So my hope would be that, hey, if I can get involved with something like that, even if I'm, you know, just helping produce it, there's so many, there's just too many ideas out there. And so, yeah, I think um part of, part of this project also is like showing that, hey, with a limited amount of money, I can pull off all these things. So imagine... If you give me a little more, what I could do. <laughs> Definitely. And I can see you doing that, of course, sometime near in the future, because <laughs> this is a brilliant project, honestly. So I'm Thank not you so much. ruling that out. Um, okay, so for every director, there is a very difficult scene to shoot, even if we as viewers feel like, okay, it wasn't that difficult. But to the director, that was difficult. And there is a moment when you're behind the monitor or you're even in the set or back in the editing room where you watch and it exceeds your expectation and you feel like you're creating cinema. This is magic. This is what I've been living for. Tell me both moments. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. I think the, the moment as far as like when we recorded on the sound stage, that was most amazing to me just on a visual standpoint as well is like, so this was a hard creative decision and I was very delicate about it. But when they, when they, when the Norse people are, are speaking with 
you know, to, uh, singing with the First Nations indigenous people that there was something amazing about that moment because I thought, oh my gosh, like, I, I don't know exactly what happened at that time period, but the fact that these two cultural pe cultured people had an interaction and I wanted to present it very equally. Like, it's not like once one person's more advanced, one person's stronger. It was like more of an even playing field where like these, these explorers were just trying to find you know, tr uh, items to trade to during their famine and they came out and then, you know, like both parties seem to, you know, benefit initially. And like, again, I don't know what happened. And it's, it's such a, it's tragic. Like, obviously if you look at history, like all the things that happened later on, but there's something so pure about like the initial contact and just to see that and see that played out, it was kind of like scary, but also amazing. Uh, and then I think the other moment was just seeing that Mikaela would get on an Icelandic horse and gallop without a helmet, without any uh, heart, like, you know, safety protocols in in the actual place where Gudrid grew up. Like she, there's a volcano behind her. And that is exactly the, the the spot where this woman who, you know, I'm just dreaming of how her life might've been through all of my research and documentaries. I mean, I, I made a documentary so many years ago about her when I went to Iceland and to actually see this actress portray her in her homeland was incredible. So those were like kind of two moments that amazed me. Wow. So you've been fascinated by these women. I want to know why you felt like you wanted to tell the stories of women. Like what compelled you as a mm. filmmaker? Do you feel like they have richer lives? Do you feel like they're the ones that we should put to the front? Because I feel it. And I think what gave weight to the film was that we had these two strong, beautiful women mm. at the center of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's twofold. I think the uh, on a personal level, I have been so inspired by um, my mother and my wife or are, are just very strong people that are like independent and have like forged ahead, uh, especially my wife's a fashion designer and like teacher and kind of seen like she left and pursued her passion. She moved to New York with no friends like in the winter and was like, no, I'm just going to do this. And like that courage, I think has been kind of uh inspiring to me and then also i i truly felt that fredis and gudrid haven't received like yeah their their representation uh in that culture and age there it's not like they were like just at home on the spindle world you know like sure there were like things to be done like that but it was a very like shared responsibility society it was a lot more modern than people think they had like a parliament way back in iceland where they settled disputes so it wasn't just like blood feuds and everything like sure we know those stories are out there as well, but also I think to ground the narrative and especially with the musical or opera project, you need your dramatic soprano leads. You can't just have like a bunch of guys, you know, talking about like how they want to conquer and, you know, everything like getting into fights. And, and like, I tried to balance that out because of course, like there's dramatic moments like that as well. Like, it's not like there wasn't, you know, it, I feel like the second half of the movie is more of that like love triangle and like, because the first the first uh, part of it is about exploration and about sort of the poetry of every, everything they're feeling. But to have a good dramatic scenario, you have to set things up, of course, so you can resolve them. And I and I wanted Freydis and Gudrid to be a part of that. But there is actually in the saga something Freydis did in the actual Icelandic saga that was too intense where I couldn't I couldn't like redeem her character because in the saga she is responsible for like all these people getting like men and women getting slaughtered and i'm like okay maybe or maybe not that happened but i want her to be like bad enough that she needs a sort of narr narrative arc but man if she's doing stuff like that like how are people going to care about her in the in the end and so i wanted to make the characters very strong but also like believable and redeemable at the end exactly yeah yeah in a way oh Thank you, Jeffrey, so much. This was just an amazing interview. I love the Thank film you. and I can't wait for the world to see it. It will be like in Regal Cinema July 9th. Yeah, so I, I, I've, I've had to switch the dates around a little bit, but that, what I for sure that in, in New York, uh, we're, we're screening at on July 16th at the Scandinavia House. Oh. And I'm going to post really soon about the other dates uh, because of 4th of July weekend, things are getting shuffled a little bit, but um, it's it'll also be streaming on Amazon Prime on July 7th as Perfect. well as Spotify, iTunes. Actually, the the album is, is like 20, 25 minutes even longer because of things I had to cut out for the film. So if you like the music, definitely head over to iTunes or Spotify as well. I can't wait for this playlist. I got to ask you for it. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you, Jalen. Appreciate it.